as we learn tonight new details about how the suspect planned the attack. And the lengths he went to to escape this new image of him disguised in women's clothing, plus this. I saw his rifle. I saw him shooting down on us. I, I, I just kind of stood there for a second. My wife screamed, get up, get up, run, get up, run. Moments of terror for a Southboro man, his wife, and their three young children as they run for their lives during the Illinois parade shooting. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us at 6. I'm Ed Martin. And I'm Erica Tarantel in for Maria this evening. We have team coverage, Karen Anderson tracking developments in the investigation. But we begin with our Mary Saladna, who spoke to that father who, understandably, is still shaken up. Mary. Yeah, Erica and Ed, uh, Sean Cotro tells me that uh, he is still haunted by what he saw. He is glad to be alive, but now he and his wife are focused on helping their three young children process what they survived yesterday. Shooter's right here. This is our stuff. This is where we are. The Cotro family of Southboro had only to look up over their shoulders to find themselves face-to-face -face with the gunman. All I can see is the shooter, right? That's about what I keep picturing is I saw his rifle. I saw him shooting down on us. If here is the building and we were like here and he was shooting down this way, it was so close, like so close. The family had set up their folding chairs near the trees by the gearhead store. The shooter was above them on the building next door. All of a sudden we hear pop, 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 pop. And I thought it was, honestly thought it was firecracker. Someone just throwing a joke. And then next thing I turn and look backwards and I see a guy with a rifle and a gun and, and just at the corner of the building just shooting down at everybody and the bullets were hitting the tree right in front of us. Sean credits wife Jacqueline for taking charge. I, I, I just kind of stood there for a second. My wife screamed, get up, get up, run, get up, run. The family hugged the storefronts as they ran, taking cover a couple of blocks away down a side street. The focus now on helping 11-year-old Cole, 9-year-old Dylan, and 2-year-old Cash process what happened and heal from it. What I learned from this is just, like, don't, don't wait. You know, don't, don't even hesitate a second um, from this type of thing. Get up and go. Even three seconds longer, and it, that, those bullets could have been reaching us. Sean says he and his wife are devastated for the families who did not walk away whole. He says Highland Park is a strong and resilient community, but it is in deep mourning tonight. I'm Mary Salata, WCVB News Center 5. Mary, thank you for that. And our coverage continuing now with News Center 5's Karen Anderson in the newsroom with the new information that we've learned about the suspected shooter. Karen. Erica, investigators just realized this revealed the suspect legally bought two high-powered rifles and three other weapons despite police being called to his home twice in 2019 for suicidal and violent threats. Seven people now confirmed dead in the Highland Park July 4th parade shooting. The victims range in age from 35 to 88 years old. Investigators say the suspect, Robert Cremo III, spent several weeks planning the attack. Police say they had two prior involvements with Cremo, both in 2019. One, a call that he had attempted suicide, and the second, five months later. A family member reported that Cremo said he was going to kill everyone, and Cremo had a collection of knives. The police responded to his residence. The police removed 16 knives, a dagger, and a sword from Cremo's home. At that time, there was no probable cause to arrest. There were arrests. Police say Cremo legally bought five guns afterwards in 2020 and 2021. Yesterday, they say he shot more than 70 rounds with an AR-15 style gun from the top of a commercial building into the crowd and evaded capture initially by dressing as a woman. Investigators have been really tirelessly working since Cremo was taken into custody, trying to determine motive. At this point, there, there is no definitive motive that he had. Now, police say the suspect drove to several locations, including into Wisconsin, then back into Illinois before someone spotted him and called 911. Now, criminal charges are expected to be filed against him and announced in the next half hour. In the newsroom, Karen Anderson, WCVB News Center 5. And Karen, thank you. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir will have much more on the parade shooting immediately following this newscast. We're also following breaking news tonight in Chelsea. Bullets flying into a McDonald's parking lot and right into a Duncan. Let's get to News Center 5. John Adwater. He's live on scene for six tonight. John. And Ed, just behind us here, you can see where that bullet pierced the window of this Dunkin' Donuts restaurant, and there was a man sitting right here at this table. He was just inches away. 
Now, this is a photo of that man at the table. He was working on his laptop, drinking a cup of coffee. Shards of glass hit his back and flew into the restaurant. And police say that stray bullet came from across the street in a McDonald's parking lot. Another customer here is a bit rattled because he usually sits right next to these windows. It's just bizarre that all we have now is people shooting at each other. It's like the wild, wild west is all over again. You don't have to be in Chicago or Texas. It's right here in beautiful downtown Chelsea. Now, police did tow a black SUV from the McDonald's parking lot. There were bullet holes in that SUV. Police say another car took off down Revere Beach Parkway. And right now, police are looking for at least two shooters. But somehow, amazingly, it appears no one was hit by this gunfire. Live in Chelsea, John Atwater, WCBB News Center 5. John, thank you. This is also breaking Sky 5 in the air over Vernon Street. This is in Wakefield, where police are investigating a serious crash. As you can see, there was extensive damage to that car. It appears that the car hit a large tree in the front lawn of a home there. Four people were hurt in this crash. Three taken to local hospitals. Another flown to a Boston hospital at this hour. There's no word of the extent of their injuries. We turn now to the weather live pictures over Boston. Storm Team 5 tracking some rain moving through. So it was kind of a battle. Was the sun ever going to come out today? Not really. Not really. I mean, it's breaking through every once yeah. in a while, but eh, wait a few minutes and there'll be a few sprinkles out there. Hasn't been very impressive on the rain scale. You see it kind of working its way through right now. A lighter stuff. In fact, a lot of this first batch is already moving offshore. You can see North Shore really kind of down to nothing around the city. A few sprinkles out there, but as you saw from our city cam, a lot of holes in that cloud cover and producing a little bit of sunlight there. But down to the south, we've got a little bit more activity through the south shore. Again, this is all really light stuff. Out to the west has a little more punch to it. We're going to see these showers moving through between now and, say, 1, 2 o'clock in the morning. And with that, there is an isolated, very slim chance there could be a rumble of thunder. Not looking for too much out of that. But you see what happens. Here's the map tonight at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight. But by about 2, 3 o'clock in the morning, it's gone. It's pretty much pushing its way offshore. Now, we may keep that threat of some scattered showers over the Cape with some cloud cover early tomorrow, but then the skies clear away, and with the clearing skies, it's going to warm up beautifully. But the nice thing about tomorrow is, look at that wind direction from the northwest. That means dry air is moving back in after a very muggy night tonight. We'll talk about how long that dry weather hangs around in a few moments, Ed. Sounds great, Mark. We'll see you in a bit. Boston City and federal leaders say they did not have intelligence ahead of time about a white nationalist organization plans to march through downtown Boston over the holiday weekend, but they're vowing to make sure that everyone knows that hate has no place here. Let's get to News Center 5, Sarah Conji. She's live in the city right now, Sarah. Ed, after a law enforcement briefing here at Boston Police Headquarters, Mayor Wu and the U.S. Attorney both revealing that there was no intelligence about this group's plans or intentions. Uh, however, they are hoping in the future to make sure uh, that that doesn't happen again. Many of these groups are using the full boundaries within the First Amendment to create a sense of fear. Saturday, members of a hate group, which police identify as Patriot Front, paraded through the streets of Boston. Some carried shields. Most hid their faces. Their shirts read, Reclaim America. In one incident, a Boston man who is black was assaulted, allegedly, by members of the group. In Boston, we have no time for hate. Leaders in Boston's black community have raised concerns about the lack of police presence during the march. It's mind-boggling to me that um, a group of 100 uh, children of the KKK were allowed to march across the span of the city. Today we have learned law enforcement did not have intelligence or information about the hate group's plans. I'm going to be looking into with the mayor to see what we could have done better, what we need to continue doing move, move, moving forward. But right now this is not vilifying the police. This is making sure that people in our communities know that hate has no place here in Boston or Massachusetts. If Patriot Front or another hate group plans to march through the city of Boston, is there much that can be done? It is protected for people to espouse their ideologies, however hateful. Um, the line is when it turns into threats or, or anything worse than that. Now, the U.S. Attorney and the Mayor say they are planning to reconvene and meet again following today's briefing in order to figure out what, if anything, can be done proactively if another group plans to set its sights on Boston. Live at police headquarters, Sarah Conji, WCVB News Center 5.
Sarah, thank you. A 13-year-old is facing charges after Boston police caught him driving a car while carrying a loaded gun. This happened 11.30 Monday night in the area of 144 Columbia Road. Officers tried to pull the car over because the registration information didn't match the vehicle. The driver refused to stop, continued to drive at a slow rate of speed. When the car finally did stop, the gun fell from the driver's leg area during a pat-down. The teen is expected to be arraigned in Dorchester Juvenile Court on several charges. This is new on 5 tonight. A third suspect has now been arrested and charged with last autumn's murder of a Brockton teenager. It was last September that 16-year-old Leetson Montero Terry was shot and killed at a party on Sprague Street. Today, Malik Cotton surrendered to police and was charged with murder and other crimes. Last week, two other men were arraigned on the same charges. Two other suspects also face lesser charges. A Dennisport man was arrested on home invasion and firearms charges. Yesterday, a Centerville resident called police, saying someone wearing a mask and carrying a gun entered their home. He was also said to be wearing a GPS bracelet. 29-year-old William Benton was arrested. Police say they seized evidence, including a semi-automatic 22 caliber rifle and a magazine containing 21 rounds of ammunition. Benton is facing a number of charges, including home invasion. Next on WCVB News Center 5. Two people fall off a boat, the boat itself out of control, the people in the ocean, how they were saved, and who managed to stop that out of control boat. Also, new details about a fire that displaced several people in Drake, and it was apparently sparked by some. Fourth of July fun. Well, it is going to be a muggy overnight tonight for sleeping, but I'll show you when the dry air 